Hello again, Tim Spector here, and thanks for listening in for this week's update. And there's a lot to cover. We're going to be discussing what's been happening with the cases, what the trends are, and we're going to also be looking at what the potential downside might be for this lifting of uh, national restrictions and also into looking internationally, see how we're comparing uh, to others and finally have a, a look at what the current symptoms are being reported by you on the app uh, for all the different stages of vaccination. So let's get to it and first result is we're seeing 33,000 new cases of symptomatic COVID is our current estimate around the country and that is up from last week but the rate is definitely dropping uh, so it's not increasing nearly as fast and we see an R value of 1.1 and within that that group those numbers are creeping up uh, so it definitely means that uh, some people are still getting uh, infected, uh, which uh, need to be aware of. And uh, as we reported last week, there's this general trend in the geography that it seems to be moving west to east. We're still seeing pretty flat levels in the northwest, but we are, are seeing east of Scotland increasing, east of England increasing, and, and London. And the other hotspots we were seeing are still occurring in those staycation areas where people are traveling a lot for their holidays and there's lots of uh, mixing with different groups and families and we continue to see that and that's likely to be a feature for the next uh, month or so. Uh, the other factor of course that's probably keeping levels up are the Euros and my advice there is by all means watch it, but if, if you can uh, try and do that uh, outside or, or, or where there's plenty of ventilation and it's not too crowded. Let's now take a look at the current rates of infection in the different vaccination groups using percentage positivity uh, in this graph. And you can see the positivity rate in the unvaccinated people was 5.25%. Positivity in those of you with one vaccine dose was 3.2% last week and the positivity rate in completely vaccinated people was 0.99% last week. So you can see this uh, six-fold difference between the groups showing that vaccines are continuing to work pretty well. And if we look at Regionally across the UK at the vaccination uh, uptake map, you can see that um, again, a fair bit of variability here, but note we're updating the map to show the total number of uh, vaccines across all age groups, not just adults. So our percentages will look a little bit lower than they have been in the past. But it's the, it's the relative effects that are interesting and you can see how London rates are still a bit worryingly low considering how densely populated it is. So do, as a reminder, book yourself in to either get a first jab or get that second jab as quickly as possible because the Delta variant uh, really uh, needs that second jab. Now let's move on to the effect of lifting restrictions and problems of long COVID. Uh, it's really good news that the government has said they're lifting restrictions and life can start to get back to normal. And so I'm uh, in favour in general of this because we need to recognise that we can't get COVID down to zero. Uh, this is a new era. Uh, we, in this for a long haul, we're going to have low levels of disease for a long time. And this is in a way a, a mark that this is, this is happening and we have to try and get back to uh, life as normal. Um, and it's hopefully gonna help education and our school children 
regain some of those those lost time out of school and hopefully change the emphasis from uh, contact tracing which at the moment is no longer useful whereas it was at other times and we we go on to checking on symptoms and actually po testing positive and the other point is that as rates stay high we are going to have to worry about long covid more than we have been in the last few months and if you remember last week we discussed these uh, new analysis by my colleagues at King's and UCL showing that young people, middle, median age around 20, have a 1.2% chance of having our definition of long COVID. And that means is, is a more restrictive definition. It means that at 12 weeks, they still have debilitating symptoms that are preventing them doing some normal activities. Now, this, using this definition, this also is increased even more so as you get older and middle-aged people, it's between four and 5%. So still significant numbers. So what this means is we've worked out that one in 80 unvaccinated people at the moment are uh, likely to go on and suffer this uh, form of long COVID and if we put that into the current figures, we are seeing 500 people a day who are unvaccinated going into that category and an extra 200 people who've uh, been vaccinated. And so that's an enormous number of people that starts to accumulate. And if we get to 50,000 cases a day, which uh, many people are predicting, we'll be up to a 1,000 uh, long COVID cases a day. And we've estimated that up to now, we've got about 180,000 individuals in the last year who uh, have a, had at least three months of uh, long COVID symptoms. And there's a graph here you can see showing that the levels of long COVID are still high uh, given this 1.2% of infected people that might develop it uh, using the uh, King's UCL estimates. And while new onsets of long COVID are much lower than the previous wave, you can still see they are very much present and still increasing. So even if there are no longer uh, large numbers of deaths, large numbers of hospitalizations, there are still these other consequences for health which longer term can cause a problem for the NHS and also the economy because people uh, won't be able to work. And obviously the number of people who have milder forms who don't meet these rather strict criteria uh, are also going to be out there and let's not forget them. So even with these relatively low risks of suffering severe illness or death, um, thousands of people could be affected, so we need to act sensibly. And a reminder that for 98% of people that catch the virus, this is not a problem. But let's not forget that small minority. So while restrictions are being lifted, there's very little guidance for employers, for example, about um, how they should behave or what guidance they should give for, say, the travel in networks etc and all of us want to try and do the best so here is my advice to act responsibly and i think first if you are socializing try to uh, do as much of it outside or in when well ventilated areas as possible secondly if you are in a, a crowded poorly ventilated area do wear a mask and this includes most forms of, of transport where you'd be crowded together. Uh, and generally keep washing your hands and practice good hygiene. Uh, there's no harm in doing that. Now, while we're not legally required to wear masks uh, after the 19th of July, uh, our own app studies that you contributed to have shown the uh, benefits to 
people wearing them, whether in the public or in uh, healthcare, that it does protect them. And this is uh, because protected against even a small amount of those viral droplets not being able to get through does make a big difference, particularly with this uh, Delta variant that is so very transmissible. And it's good to hear that some uh, companies are being responsible, like Ryanair, uh, saying they are going to keep their rules about uh, face masks going and I hope other uh, responsible bodies will act similarly. And I don't think this is anything to do with freedom. Uh, I think this is very different and I think all of us would expect if we had an operation for the doctor to wear a mask uh, and we expect our dentist also to wear one. So uh, common courtesy, uh, if you had a cold and you were sneezing, uh, you wouldn't go out and spread it around. So the same general rules I think should apply. And I, I guess I'm not alone, but I really enjoyed not having a cold for the last 18 months. I get sinusitis and it's been marvellous not to have that. So you do suddenly realise that these things are uh, under our control to prevent and you can see why places like uh, in Japan, they routinely use them uh, every winter out of, uh, out of choice. So let's look at where we are in the international context. So we can still see from this graph that we are uh, amongst the highest in Europe. Um, above Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, Germany, France, uh, although you can see some of these going up in the wrong direction, particularly Spa Spain and Portugal. And this isn't just, as some people believe, that we're testing more. Uh, these are uh, confirmed cases per head of population. And now the UK rates are higher than uh, the USA. Although it's interesting to see that the USA has around 40% of cases due to Delta. And so I think they will be uh, following us pretty soon. And UK rates are much higher than Australia. And in Sydney, it's quite interesting that they've had 300 cases a day, which is uh, less than 10% of what we're seeing here. And decide that's enough to have a a lockdown of New South Wales and this is really because they have only about 10% of their population vaccinated and so showing how being vaccinated really does uh, give us more freedom uh, against this eventuality. And now that we know about the symptoms post-vaccination in the young I think other countries like the US and Australia can start to hopefully learn from our experiences and spread the word about these symptoms. Now, as we discuss symptom changes uh, and our top five of the week, it's more important to ever to realize uh, this ranking because the pandemic is absolutely not over and lots of people are getting infected. So it's really important that everyone understands what the common signs and symptoms are to look for. And if you look at uh, these, these top five, for most of you who are listening have probably had two vaccines by now. Uh, it's still headache, runny nose, sneezing, sore throat. Um, the common ones, loss of smell has just crept into number five uh, from number eight. Uh, it's, but it's still one of the lesser ones and you can see fever and cough really don't figure in there at all. One dose it's it's pretty similar uh, with cough uh, instead. Unvaccinated um, you have got fever in at number four and cough at number five. Uh, so they, they are occurring but you might just have the first three that just makes you think you've got a bad cold. So I think the government does have a responsibility to tell people about these and we need to move away from the 18 month old idea this is just uh, fever cough and loss of smell and and move on and allow people to uh, get pcr tests and because you know cough and fever really just aren't uh, uh, as important as they were so 
If you do have any of these cold-like symptoms, do stay at home, don't infect anyone else, get a lateral flow test from your local chemist, and you can always repeat that uh, on several days, which makes them more reliable. And if you need to, get a confirmatory PCR test, which you can get uh, via our app if you're unable to get it uh, through the NHS. And we all need to keep reporting these symptoms so we find out what's going on and whether the variant itself is, is changing any of this. But um, this is really important that we all act together because up to one in 50 of us are going to have long-term health problems uh, if uh, we don't get these numbers down. So we are, on another note, getting reports of new Delta Plus variants and even Lambda variants from South America, which may be coming here soon. And so it's really important that you keep uh, sending us your data and we can uh, keep looking at it and keeping you absolutely informed. So thanks for your contributions daily, which are amazing. And please remember to like and subscribe uh, on this channel and uh, look out for any notifications and stay safe and keep logging. Thanks for your support.